Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to talk about the case of the Attorney General for Canada and Stark. And you'll see here it's got a judgment filed stamp of today, November 30th. So this case is hot off the presses and it's a bit of a big deal. Now you may see me with a glass here. Uh, you might be thinking, oh no, this is a sad video. That's not really how scotch works. You can have sadness scotch or you can have celebration scotch and this is a celebration scotch so don't get confused let's have a look at what this case talks about because and i'll try to explain why i think this case matters and why it's important so what we have here is that mr stark received from the registrar of firearms a letter which mr stark took to be a notice under section 72 sub 1 of the firearms act uh, that the registrar had revoked certain registration certificates held by mr stark Mr. Stark filed in the Provincial Court of Alberta a Section 74 review of that uh, revocation, the review application. So what this is referring to is that letter that says, hey, um, we have nullified your firearm certificates. So he says that that's a revocation and he wants to challenge it. The Attorney General for Canada files an application, the jurisdiction application, for an order striking out Mr. Stark's review application. So they want to cancel this before it's actually heard. They want to say, no, you cannot come to court on this issue because the court is not entitled to hear it. The Attorney General took the position that the letter from the Registrar of Firearms did not constitute a notice of revocation and therefore the Provincial Court of Alberta did not have jurisdiction to hear the review application. So as a bit of background, there's actually a bunch of cases where the court has criticized the Canadian Firearms Program, usually in the form of the Chief Firearms Officer, for essentially playing games, and that's actually a quote, believe it or not, uh, with respect to trying to avoid the Section 74 references by sort of trying to dodge uh, issuing proper revocations and that kind of thing. You might say, well, why do they want to do that? Well, Section 74 applications get you into provincial court, which is where you probably want to be if you're challenging this because it's way cheaper to bring this application in provincial court than it is to go to federal court, especially because if you are a self-rep, there's also evidentiary provisions here that will make this easier for you. However, uh, federal court is insanely daunting. I would not recommend going there you know, as a self-rep. And the Firearms Act, the Section 74 processes were built to make it somewhat accessible because they're sort of thinking that it might need to be open to, you know, a farmer or an Aboriginal person living on reserve or, you know, a hunter, any of these sorts of people without necessarily hiring counsel for it. They're trying to make this open and accessible. Now, it's always a better idea to have counsel because lots of people go to these things and get hammered because they didn't bring a lawyer but that's sort of why this matters is that we want to have these things heard in provincial court where they belong so they note these uh, reasons set out my ruling and the reasons therefore in the attorney general's application and references are to the firearms act unless they state otherwise so issues the overarching issue in this application is whether the provincial court of alberta has jurisdiction to hear the application filed by mr stark in which he purports to invoke Section 74 of the Firearms Act. The primary issue is whether the letter sent to Mr. Stark by the Registrar of Firearms constituted a notice of revocation of certain registration certificates under Section 71 1A of the Firearms Act. So they say he owned certain firearms and he had registration certificates for them. I'm going to skip over what he owns because that's really just being nosy. So... <laughs> Each of the firearm registration certificates had printed above it a message which contained, amongst other things, the following statements. The firearm registration certificate is issued to the owner for a specific firearm. The registration certificate is valid until the firearm is transferred or disposed of or the certificate is revoked. This is a correct statement of law that's printed on the registration certificates, which now the registrar wants to pretend doesn't exist because it's awkward. Hmm... So the firearm registration certificate is issued by the registrar under the authority of the Firearms Act. On May 1st, 2020, the governor and council made a regulation effective that day under the terms of which certain firearms previously classified as restricted firearms were reclassified as prohibited firearms. And they go through it 
Um, if you're a gun owner, you are probably familiar with this. If you are not, this is where they banned AR-15s, they banned the CX-4, they banned the Mini-14, they banned firearms with a bore diameter of 20 millimeters or greater, they banned firearms that are capable of discharging a projectile with a muzzle energy greater than 10,000 joules, and so forth. So this is the order in council. This is the recent liberal gun ban. So concurrently on May 1st, the governor and council pursuant to section 117.14 of the criminal code made a regulation effective that day, which created an amnesty period for those who found themselves in possession of a firearm, which as a result of the ban was reclassified as a prohibited firearm, which is why I don't have police kicking down my door right now to drag me away in the cell, you know, into cells for still having some of the firearms that are on this list. I guess I appreciate that, although I do not appreciate the ban, so... Meh. The amnesty order, as it applies to firearms, applies to a person who, one, on the day in which the order comes into force, owns or possesses a specified firearm and holds a license that was issued under the Firearms Act, so it doesn't cover people who didn't have a, a gun license, uh, at any time during the amnesty period is in possession of the specified firearm, during the amnesty period, continues to hold the license while in possession of the specified firearm. So if your license expires, you lose the gun. And if the specified firearm was on the day before the day in which the order came into force, a restricted firearm held on the day before the day in which this order comes into force, lovely non-complicated language there, a registration certificate for the specified firearm that was issued under the Firearms Act. So you also need to have had it registered if it was restricted. However, many of these are non-restricted firearms that they've banned. Many people have found that their hunting, you know, rifles or shotguns are now banned. So that's where we're going. And they permit a whole bunch of purposes. I've covered those in another video, so I'm going to skip over those for time. Registrar of firearms sent to Mr. Stark, who resides in Calgary, Alberta, a letter dated July 20th, 2020. The letter said... On May 1st, 2020, well, I'm going to skip over it because you may already have a copy of those letters. Uh, but the uh, the key bit here is that they say certain restricted firearms which were registered to you have been affected by the recent regulatory amendments. These firearms listed below are now classified as prohibited and the previous registration certificates are automatically nullified and are therefore no longer valid, but should be retained as a historical registration record. The problem that we come up here is that the automatically nullified doesn't appear in the law. There are provisions for automatic nullification of registration certificates, but they don't kick in here. None of them apply to this circumstance. So how do they get to saying that it's automatically nullified? So that's why Mr. Stark says that this is a revocation rather than something else. So the letter then listed the three registration certificate numbers and the corresponding makes, types of firearms, serial numbers, and firearm identification numbers, all as noted above. In listing the registration certificates, the letter described them as registration certificate number no longer valid. Mr. Stark filed with the clerk of the provincial court a reference under section 74, which, uh, so he's applying to challenge this decision. And as a preliminary matter, the Attorney General brought the application, which is presently before me, that being the judge, for an order striking out the reference to a provincial court judge. The basis for the Attorney General's application to strike is generally described that the Registrar of Firearms did not revoke Mr. Stark's registration certificates, and consequently, the prerequisites for invoking Section 74 of the Firearms Act do not exist, with the consequence that no judge of the provincial court has jurisdiction to hear Mr. Stark's reference. So once again, they're trying to pretend that this automatic nullification is a thing in the law, which I don't think it is. And they're also trying to dodge this uh, Section 74 challenge. They don't want it to proceed on that basis. So now they're going to go through the law and analysis, which is the good part. So Section 71 of the Firearms Act states that the registrar may revoke a registration certificate for a restricted firearm for any good and sufficient reason. They state that subject to subsection 1.1, which doesn't apply in the case at bar, if the registrar decides to revoke a registration certificate, the registrar shall give notice of the decision in the prescribed form to the holder of the registration certificate. If you're wondering if you got a notice in the prescribed form, you did not. So section 71 sub 2 states that a notice given under the subsection 1 
must include the reasons for the decision, disclosing the nature of the information relied on for the decision, and must be accompanied by a copy of Section 74 to 81. Why does it have to be, why does it have to include those? Because those are the provisions that tell you how to challenge it in provincial court. So they actually have to give you the instructions for how you fight their decision. Of course, they don't want to give you those. They don't want to tell you that you can fight them, so they don't. So Section 71 sub 5 states that a notice given under subsection 1 in respect to of a registration certificate for a prohibited firearm or a restricted firearm must specify a reasonable period during which the applicant for or holder of the registration certificate may deliver to a peace officer or a firearms officer or a chief firearms officer or otherwise lawfully dispose of the firearm to which the registration certificate relates and during which sections 91, 92, and 94 of the criminal code do not apply to the applicant or holder. Those are the sections that get you in trouble for having a firearm without a registration certificate. So it's saying, you know, basically you get a notice that says we're revoking your license to have this particular restricted firearm. They have to give you a reasonable period to get rid of it so that you're not immediately a criminal upon receipt of the letter. You, you know, if you don't then dispose of it in some fashion, then you would be. So section 74 of the Firearms Act states that where the registrar revokes a registration certificate, the holder of the registration certificate may refer the matter to a provincial court judge in the territorial division in which the holder resides. Section 74 sub 2 goes on to say that a holder may only refer a matter to a provincial court judge under subsection 1 within 30 days after receiving notice of the decision of the registrar under section 72. So there's a 30 day time limit which starts when you get the, uh, the notice. Position of the Attorney General. The Attorney General, the applicant on this application to strike out the reference to a provincial court judge, submitted that, one, the registrar's letter to Mr. Stark did not constitute a revocation by the registrar of Mr. Stark's registration certificates. The registrar was only providing to Mr. Stark information about the effects of the law, which are both creations of the governor and council. Consequently, the authority granted by section 74 and 75 to a judge of the provincial court to here, the reference does not come into play. The reference should be struck out. So position one is that this is not a notice, like this is not a revocation notice. They're just giving you information. That's it. And they say, even if the court were to conclude that the registrar had revoked Mr. Stark's registration certificates, and therefore the court has jurisdiction to hear the reference, there can be no outcome but a confirmation of the revocation, and the reference should be struck out pursuant to Rule 3.68 of the Alberta Rules of Court. So they're saying that it's a guaranteed outcome and therefore uh, we should just strike out the application on that basis. To my mind, that's more than a jurisdiction question. That's saying before you even hear the evidence, you need to strike out this application. That's uh, a bit of a heavy thing there. But anyway, we'll go on and see how the court deals with it. Position of Mr. Stark. So he submitted that the letter from the registrar did constitute a revocation by the registrar of Mr. Stark's registration certificates, and therefore sections 74 and 75 apply. Again, those are the sections that let you take this into provincial court and challenge this. Mr. Stark submitted that the letter was evidence of a decision made by the registrar to revoke the three certificates referred to in the letter. Mr. Stark submitted that the word nullified, as used in the letter, is not a term found in the Firearms Act, nor is it found in either of the uh, the orders. So Mr. Stark submitted that the governor and council did not state that it was nullifying registration certificates such as the well, ones held by Mr. Stark, and that if the registration certificates were nullified, and nullify is a term which must be taken to be equivalent to revoke, then it was the registrar who exercised his statutory power to revoke. Consequently, the court has jurisdiction to hear the reference. I think this is exactly the right argument here. This is exactly what the court should be looking at because the fact that they made up a new word to get around the word revoke shouldn't allow them to dodge court challenges. That is serious game playing. So I don't approve of sort of what they're doing here. It's part of what I see as a pattern of bad behavior from the Canadian Firearms Program. So Mr. Stark submitted that it is premature to conclude that no remedy is available to him. So the court's analysis. It is a criminal offense for a person to possess either a restricted or prohibited firearm while that person knows 
that he or she is not the holder of both the license under which the person may possess the firearm and a registration certificate for that firearm. The Attorney General submitted that uh, the, the gun ban had two results. One, the three firearms referred to in the letter from Mr. Stark were, as of May 1st, 2020, reclassified as prohibited firearms. And two, the three registration certificates previously issued to Mr. Stark in relation to those firearms were made invalid. And again, what tells us that they're made invalid? That's going to be the key part here. The Attorney General further submitted that as a result of sections 12.1 and 13 of the Firearms Act, an individual cannot possess a registration certificate for a prohibited firearm unless that individual is authorized to possess prohibited firearms. And they quote the sections which say just exactly that. It is evident that all section 12.1 says is that a registration certificate may only be issued in relation to a restricted or prohibited firearm. Section 13 simply says that a person is not eligible to hold a registration certificate for a particular firearm unless the person holds a license to possess that particular kind of firearm. Section 13 of the Firearms Act speaks only of the eligibility of a person to lawfully hold a registration certificate. The section does not affect the registration certificate itself. It only affects the ability to lawfully hold the registration certificate. I should also note here that usually revocations are based on a argument that you are no longer eligible to hold a license or eligible to hold a registration certificate. So let's say somebody goes and, you know, they attempt suicide or something along those lines. And the uh, so accordingly, the they say you can't hold a firearms license because you are a danger to yourself. But the reason why they say you can't hold one is that you are no longer eligible to hold a firearms license by reason of being a danger to yourself. If this argument were accepted, it would basically give them a get out of jail free card on Section 74 references at all. That seems like a big problem to me, and we'll see what the court does. So the Attorney General submitted that as a result of Mr. Stark's firearms being reclassified from restricted to prohibited, and since Mr. Stark was not eligible to hold a registration certificate for prohibited firearms, he did not have a license to possess prohibited firearms, the registration certificates held by Mr. Stark became invalid. So, and they offer the decision of Sherby and Canada Attorney General, which is a 2009 decision. And they say, in that case, uh, Mr. Sherby, I'm probably mispronouncing it, sorry, uh, entered into a Section 810 peace bond, one of the terms of which was a prohibition against possessing firearms. The registrar wrote to Mr. Sherby and told him that as a result of the prohibition, his registration certificate had been revoked. Mr. Sherby applied under Section 74 for reference to the judge of the Provincial Court. Both the Provincial Court judge and the British Columbia Supreme Court Justice took the view that the registrar had not affected the revocation of the registration certificate. The revocation certificate was revoked by operation of Section 116 sub 1 of the Criminal Code. That section states, Every registration certificate relating to anything the possession of which is pro uh, prohibited by a prohibition order and issued to a person against whom the prohibition order is made is on the commencement of the prohibition order revoked to the extent of the prohibitions in the order. In the case of Mr. Sherby, it was clear that the revocation of his registration certificate had been affected by Section 116 sub 1 of the Criminal Code. The section specifically uh, said that the registration was revoked. Now, this argument is BS, and the judge is about to tell us why. I'll let the judge speak first, and then I'll amplify that. So with respect, the Sherby case does not assist the Attorney General in the case at bar. No provision of the Criminal Code or of the Firearms Act or the two orders in Council make any mention of registration certificates being revoked as a result of the orders in Council and the reclassification of Mr. Stark's firearms. Rather, a different case from the British Columbia Supreme Court is support for the proposition that Mr. Stark's registration certificates continued to exist in law after the firearms to which they related had been reclassified as prohibited. So what this means is that if you get a probation order or a peace bond or a firearm prohibition order or some other court order that bans you specifically from having guns, there's a provision in the criminal code that then cancels your registration certificate. But the order in council is not an order such that is contemplated in that section. So the judge is saying, this case doesn't help you because it's a case about an entirely different thing. So, no, we're not buying that argument. So, moving on. In Barrett in Canada, 
Uh, Mrs. Barrett, uh, or Ms. Barrett, rather, obtained a firearm acquisition certificate in February 1995. Later in 1995, Ms. Barrett acquired registration certificates for two handguns. Those handguns were, at the time, classified as restricted firearms. At the time, no license was required to lawfully possess the handguns. The FAC was needed to acquire the handguns. On December 5, 1995, the Firearms Act, which replaced the criminal code as the legislation which controlled the registration and regulation of firearms, was given royal assent. A sad day. Most of its provisions came into effect on December 1, 1998. Under the new legislation, it became necessary to have both a registration certificate and a license to possess firearms such as the ones possessed by Ms. Barrett. The license requirement was new and previously issued FACs were deemed to be a license to possess firearms. However, Ms. Barrett allowed her FAC to expire on February 10, 2000. Further, under the provisions of the Firearms Act, all registration certificates previously issued to the Criminal Code uh, were deemed to expire on December 31, 2002. Ms. Barrett applied to renew her registration certificates on October 2002. In 2008, she learned that her application for registration certificates had been refused. She applied... 2008 from 2002? I knew backlogs were bad at the CFO's office, but I didn't know they were that bad. Man. So, ultimately, she was unsuccessful in obtaining a registration certificate for her now prohibited firearms. However, what is relevant to the matter at bar is that Justice McEwen was of the view that Ms. Barrett's registration certificates continued to exist up until their expiry date of December 31st, 2002, which was long after Ms. Barrett was no longer eligible to hold those certificates because her FAC, her deemed license, had expired, and long after her firearms had been reclassified as prohibited. Justice McEwen said, It is not, strictly speaking, correct to speak of Ms. Barrett's right to keep a prohibited firearm. She's only permitted to possess such a weapon if she's authorized by the legislation to do so. On the face of it, she was not, because the legislation requires the owner to be licensed and the firearm to be registered. Because Ms. Barrett's deemed license, the FAC, had expired on February 10, 2000, she was not eligible to hold a registration certificate. By the time Ms. Barrett's registration certificate expired on December 31, 2002, she had been ineligible for over two years. It is also interesting to note that Parliament must have taken the view that the registration certificates which had been issued for restricted firearms still existed after the reclassification of the firearms as prohibited. If Parliament was not of the opinion that the registration certificates existed after reclassification, then it would not have been necessary to set an expiration date for those registration certificates. That is solid. And I'm going to take a little moment here to note that uh, counsel on this matter was Greg Dunn out of Calgary. And all signs of what I can see in this judgment show that he did excellent work. I've spoken with Mr. Dunn. I actually talked with him a bit about sort of firearm issues because it's hard to find lawyers who really understand the ins and outs of the Firearms Act and of these sorts of complex issues. But so there's not a whole lot of people who I sort of confidently recommend in these areas, but I will give a shout out to Mr. Dunn as somebody who you can rely on in these matters. He's in Calgary, so close to me, but uh, again, he does good work. So props to Mr. Dunn here, and he should be on your list if you are in the Calgary area. So from all that, we can take that the registration certificates held by Mr. Stark did not cease to exist on May 1st, 2020 upon the making of the gun ban when his firearms were reclassified as prohibited, even though Mr. Stark was, as of that date, no longer permitted to possess a registration certificate for those prohibited firearms because he did not possess a license to possess prohibited firearms. The Attorney General submitted that the registration certificates issued in relation to Mr. Stark's firearms became invalid when the firearms, previously classified as restricted, were reclassified as prohibited. The Attorney General pointed to the registration certificates and noted that each certificate at the time of its issuance referred to the class of firearm as being restricted. The submission was that the registration certificate no longer referred to the, or no longer applied to the firearm once it was reclassified as prohibited. The act of reclassification made the registration certificate invalid. That's a clever argument. I will give the Attorney General's lawyer you know, props for that one. However, that just says that there's an error on it. That doesn't say that it should cease to to function. 
So let's have a look at what the judge says here because, and I know I'm going through a lot of this decision. It's going to be a long video, but this is a really good decision and it really covers a lot of the stuff. So I really want to share it with you guys sort of, I guess, close to in its entirety. Uh, the difficulty with that submission, which is to the effect that the registration certificate ceased to exist in law because of the reclassification of the firearm, is that the Firearms Act itself contemplates the continuation of a valid registration certificate issued for a firearm, which at the time was classified as restricted, after that firearm is reclassified as prohibited. For example, in the grandfathering provisions of the Firearms Act, one is only able to enjoy the benefits of the grandfathering provisions in relation to the now prohibited firearm, if one keeps uh, current the registration certificate which was issued for the firearm when it was restricted. See, for example, section 12.6, and in particular section 12.6b, one could not keep the registration certificate current if the act of reclassification from restricted to prohibited had, in and of itself, caused the registration certificate to be invalid and to cease to exist in law. Honestly, I'm also going to give a shout out to Judge Fradsham here because... This is really good reasoning. I really like the uh, I like the logic in this. And, you know, when I say that, I'm not just saying it because I agree with the decision and because I like the decision. I've had decisions against me where you get reasoning like this and you just go, man, the judge is right. I really like to see this kind of careful analysis, this sort of in-depth look at secondary sources to you know, examine this because this is a tough question. And the judge here is really engaging with the legislation and the material in a way that should be the gold standard. This should be what judges are doing all the time. Sadly, it's not always what judges do, but this is a really well-written and well-reasoned decision, which I think means that it's going to be very useful. And to spoil myself a little bit, I have one of these coming up myself going to be heard in January and frankly Mr. Dunn and Judge Fradsham have done a lot of heavy lifting for uh, for me on it. This is going to be a huge thing uh, both for my own case upcoming and for gun owners across Canada. This is a big deal. So continuing on. The registrar, registrar of firearms used the word nullified. However, the legislation which created the registration certificates only contemplates the following states of being for registration certificates. 1. Issuance. 2. Revocation. 3. Expiry. The criminal code only speaks of surrendering or revoking. Neither piece of legislation, when referring to registration certificates, speaks in terms of invalidity or nullifying. So they're getting to a good part here, which is they're basically saying, you guys are making up words in order to sort of bullshit your way around the uh, the thing which is exactly what's going on here they're making up a word and claiming it has legal significance when it's never been used in case law or in you know in the legislation before so they're essentially trying to give themselves a new legal power that does not exist in the law that is a big problem so the court is not going to uh not going to have a whole lot of time for this as we'll see the Attorney General submitted that it was the Governor and Council through the uh, the gun ban and not the Registrar of Firearms who invalidated the, the registration certificates in relation to the now prohibited firearms of Mr. Stark. I agree that it was the Governor and Council who reclassified Mr. Stark's firearms with attendant consequences, somewhat ameliorated by uh, the amnesty, in relation to the ability to possess those firearms. However, the Governor and Council did not cause those new uh, those registration certificates to cease to exist in law. They could only cease to exist in law absent new legislation eliminating them by way of revocation, expiry, or surrender. For example, if the governor and council had by a new order in council made on May 2nd, 2020, simply rescinded the order by its in, in its entirety, there's nothing that was stated in the amnesty that would suggest that the, or sorry, in the gun ban that would suggest that the previously issued registration certificates for the firearms affected no longer existed in law and would have to be reissued. The Attorney General, relying on the reasoning set out in Canada and Whitmore, also submitted that Section 74 is not available to Mr. Stark because the Registrar of Firearms did not make any decision in relation to Mr. Stark's firearms. The Attorney General submitted that revocation requires the exercise of judgment or discretion in light of particular facts. Quoting from paragraph 35 of Whitmore, 
and that the Registrar of Firearms was not engaged in that function when he or she sent out the letter of July 2020. I have some comments on this, but I think the judge is probably going to preempt me here. And I'm, I will admit, I haven't gone through this case in full detail because I saw this case and I wanted to share it with you as fast as possible. So I'm sort of going through this a bit on the fly here. So the court says, I respectfully disagree. When the Registrar of Firearms sent the letter dated July 20th, 2020, they had decided that it applied to the three specific firearms and registration certificates listed in the letter. So the judge is, in fact, going where I wanted to go. The registrar considered the particular information available to him or her and concluded that the firearms noted on registration certificates, and they list them, were firearms that were included in the hundreds of firearms listed in the gun ban. Their inclusion in the firearms listed is not evident simply by reading the list. The registrar made an individualized decision in specific reference to Mr. Stark's firearms. So what this means is that if you have an AR-15 and they say, you know, or some gun that the registrar takes to be an AR-15, and they say we are canceling or we are nullifying the registration certificate in relation to that, that they have made a decision. That decision is that this particular firearm is an AR-15 or is one of the other guns that is covered by the firearms ban. And that's a decision that could be wrong. They might be wrong about your gun being an AR-15. You might be sitting there going, how is this an AR-15? You know, this is actually my Tokarev pistol. It's nothing like an AR-15. Why would this registration certificate be nullified? And how would you challenge that decision unless Section 74 is available to you? So the possibility that they make a mistake here and the fact that they're relying on, you know, an individualized decision with respect to that gun is part of the reason that the judge here is saying that this is a reviewable decision under Section 74. Again, love the writing, love the reasoning. This is wonderful. So in order to determine whether the letter from the registration of uh, fire, or Registrar of Firearms constituted an act revoking Mr. Stark's three firearms certificates, it is necessary to first review the applicable statutory provisions. So he's going back to the law, which is always where we want to start. Section 71 says that they may revoke uh, for a good and sufficient reason. Uh, it also uh, states that subject to an exception, which is not applicable here, uh, if the registrar decides to revoke a registration certificate, they shall give notice in the prescribed form to the holder of the registration certificate. Section 72 states that a notice given under subsection one must include reasons for the decision, disclosing the nature of the information relied on for the decision and must be accompanied by a copy of section 74 to 81. Now this is similar to an argument that was made in a previous case that is a case I'm very familiar with because it is Runkel v. Canada. This Runkel. And in that case, one of the arguments that they made is that we haven't, we know that we haven't made a decision that is reviewable under Section 74, because if we had made such a decision, then we'd have given you notice, and we didn't give you notice, so we didn't make a decision like that. Which is a little like, it's a weird argument. But that's the one they were, one of the ones they were relying on. So Section 72 sub 5 states, a notice given under subsection 1 in respect of a registration certificate for a prohibited firearm or a restricted firearm must specify a reasonable period during which the applicant for or holder of the registration certificate may deliver to a peace officer or a firearms officer or a chief firearms officer or otherwise lawfully dispose of the firearm to which the registration certificate relates and during which sections 91, 92, and 94 do not apply. The letter dated July 20th is not in the prescribed form. It was not accompanied by a copy of section 7481. The question is, is it reasonable to conclude that the letter uh, are dated or had decided to revoke the registration certificate specifically described in the letter? So it communicated the following pieces of information. One, it's from the Registrar of Firearms. Two, that they'd amended the regulations. Uh, three, that there was an amnesty order that was in effect. Uh, four, that certain restricted firearms uh, have been affected by it, and it lists the specific ones. And that five, those listed firearms are now classified as prohibited, and the registration certificates are automatically nullified and no longer valid. And six, that the government intends to implement a buyback program. Seven, what you can do with them, which is not a whole lot, unfortunately. Eight, wait for further instructions, you know, what you can do in terms of your options. And... Thankfully, we're moving on because I was running out of fingers. Uh, 
So through the letter, the Registrar of Firearms told Mr. Stark that the registration certificates specifically identified and listed in the letter are automatically nullified and are no longer valid. So nothing in the Firearms Act or the gun ban states that the registration certificates are nullified automatically or otherwise. Likewise, nothing in either the Firearms Act or the gun ban states that the registration certificates are no longer valid. Indeed, as previously explained, the registration certificates continued to exist in law after the firearm reclassifications. It doesn't nullify or make invalid the registration certificates. Consequently, if the, fire, or if the Registrar of Firearms was of the opinion expressed in the letter that the registration certificates were nullified and were no longer valid, which was the message sent by the Registrar to Mr. Stark, then that nullification and the invalidity must have come about as a result of an act of the Registrar of Firearms. This is very clean, crisp, concise thinking. It's basically saying there is nothing in the law that lets you nullify. And so if these registration certificates are canceled, it's because you did it. Beautiful. I love it. Raising a glass here. Uh, nothing in the Firearms Act says that the registrar can nullify a registration certificate or declare it to be no longer valid. But they sure wanted to give themselves that power, didn't they? They just wanted to say... Mm, we're going to invent ourselves some new powers. That's that's cool, right? We're just going to, I mean, if that's what we're doing, why don't I just invent myself a power to, you know, take my AR-15 to the range? Oh, right. The law doesn't let people invent powers for themselves. So moving on. However, the Firearms Act does empower the registration of firearms to revoke a registration certificate for any good and sufficient reason. The term revoke is not defined in the Firearms Act or the Criminal Code. The dictionary uh, defines revoke as follows, rescind, withdraw, or cancel a license, decision, promise, etc. The same dictionary defines nullify as follows, make legally null and void, annul, invalidate, make of no value or use, cancel out, neutralize. The only power available to the registrar, the exercise of which would render the registration certificates nullified and no longer valid, is the power of revocation. Indeed, the terms revoke and nullify and invalidate share the same denotation and the same connotation, i.e. they share the same meaning. They mean the same thing. I'm getting a little ranty here. It might be uh, through the help of some scotch, but this is a case worth ranting about happily. So consequently, one must conclude that the act of the registrar which nullified and made no longer valid the registration certificates listed in the July 20th, 2020 letter was the revocation of those registration certificates by the registrar. I find that the Registrar of Firearms did revoke the registration certificates listed in the July 20th, 2020 letter directed to Mr. Stark. The July 20th letter uh, uh, told Mr. Stark the reason for the revocation, the reclassification. It also informed Mr. Stark what he could do with the reclassified firearms and that he would have until April 30th, 2020 under an amnesty order to dispose of the firearms. In my respectful view, the July 20th letter uh, gave notice to Mr. Stark of the decision of the Registrar to revoke the registration certificates listed in the letter. As previously noted, I am mindful that the July 20th letter was not in the prescribed form for a Section 72 notice, and that it was not accompanied by a copy of Section 74 to 81. However, in all other respects, it complied with the notice provisions of the Firearms Act, and the deficiencies noted do not change the character and notice of revocation of the document. The deficiencies may have other consequences. I'm gonna mention that soon. But that is not for me to decide in the application for the Attorney General. I'm gonna talk about what other consequences that may have. We'll wait to the end of the video, but stay tuned. I know this is a long one, but it's a long one that I think is worth it. Stick with me here. So I find that I have the jurisdiction to hear the Section 74-1 referral of the decision of the registration a Registrar of Firearms to revoke the registration certificates listed in the July 20th, 2020 letter sent to Mr. Stark. I am mindful that the Honorable Judge Gorman of the Provincial Court of Newfoundland and Labrador has reached a different conclusion on the question of jurisdiction, and they list the case. I'm also aware that the Provincial Court of New Brunswick, in similar factual circumstances, has simply refused to allow the filing of requests for re uh, reviews under Section 74.1. I respectfully disagree with those decisions for the reasons which I have set out herein. And I, I mean, in terms of Judge Gorman's decision... I don't like the reasoning for it. I don't think it's anywhere near as persuasive and as thorough as this one. In terms of the actions of the Court of New Brunswick, I have strong words for that because refusing to allow people to file uh, 
is egregious in my view. There are certain circumstances where people can be refused to allow, you know, to be allowed to file uh, references, but that's typically when you're talking about people who are what are called vexatious litigants. To simply say, we're going to decide this issue without you even getting into a courtroom? Come on. So that, I've made a video about that previously, but again, that to me is a shocking thing to happen in our court system. So thumbs down to the courts of New Brunswick on that one. And I hope that this decision will force them to change that because it'll show that there is a live justiciable issue here. So the Attorney General submitted that even if the Registrar of Firearms had revoked Mr. Stark's registration certificates, Mr. Stark's Section 741 review application should be struck out because no meaningful remedy is available to Mr. Stark, and that in those circumstances the hearing of the application is a waste of judicial resources. The Attorney General submitted that by virtue of Section 8.2 of the Provincial Court Act, the court may apply Rule 3.68 which states, if the circumstances warrant and a condition under subrule 2 applies, the court may order one or more of the following. A, that all or any part of a claim or defense be struck out, or that a commencement document or pleading be amended or set aside. So essentially they want to throw out these documents uh, or the filing here. And they uh, go on to state the conditions for the order of one or more of the following. A commencement document or pleading discloses no reasonable claim or defense to a claim commencement document or pleading is frivolous, irrelevant, or improper, or it constitutes an abuse of process. I agree that Section 82 of the Provincial Court allows me to apply Rule 3.68 of the Alberta Rules of Court because neither the Provincial Court Act nor the regulations under that Act provide for a specific practice or procedure of the Court that is necessary to ensure an expeditious and inexpensive resolution of a Section 74 Firearms Act review application. So he says those sections can be applied. Having said that, I am of the view that Mr. Stark's Section 74.1 review application does not give rise to any of the conditions set out in Rule 3.68 sub 2. Published in the same Canada Gazette as the ban was a regulatory impact analysis statement. The, uh, the statement begins with this sentence. This statement is not part of the regulations or the order. However, regardless of the fact that the statement does not form part of the regulations or order, it is clear that it is published as being information provided by the Government of Canada and it would be offensive to the honor of the government to say that it has no meaning and those reading it should place no reliance upon its contents. So government, when you say things, the court's going to take them seriously. Love it. Contained in the regulatory impact analysis statement is the following. The government of Canada intends to implement a buyback program, which would allow affected owners to declare their intent to deliver their firearms to a police officer. The buyback, pro or buyback would compensate affected owners for the value of their firearms after they are delivered to a police officer. An option to participate in a grandfathering regime would also be made available for affected owners. Emphasis added. Any fair reading of that paragraph would lead a person to conclude that the government might, but not necessarily will, institute a buyback program for firearms and the government might, but not necessarily will, make available to firearm owners a grandfathering regime. Section 12 of the Firearms Act provides for the grandfathering of individuals who, as of certain dates uh, specified, possess certain firearms set out in the various subsections of the section. A constant requirement set out in the various subsections is that for a person to receive the benefit of the grandfathering provisions, the particular individual was continuously the holder of a registration certificate for the firearm. So, this is, this is good. So they, they note here, and they're going to quote the sections, I'll skip over it, other than the part where it says here, was continuously the holder of a registration certificate for one or more of these firearms. So he's point, the judge here is pointing out that the loss of the registration certificate may have consequences. While none of this commits the government of Canada to implement a grandfathering regime, or if it does choose to implement a grandfathering regime, to include in that regime provisions to are similar to the provisions which form part of the previous grandfathering regimes, it is reasonable for those reading the statement and who might benefit from such a firearms grandfathering regime to conclude that it is very likely, though not certain, that the continuous holding of a registration uh, certificate will form part of the regime's requirements. For that reason alone, i.e. that you know, they might be able to be grandfathered if you have a registration certificate. 
Mr. Stark's Section 74 review application is not frivolous or an abusive process. That application seeks a remedy, cancellation of the revocation of the registration certificate, which might turn out to be essential for Mr. Stark to enjoy the benefits of the possible grandfathering regime mentioned in the statement. That possibility is enough to support a finding, which I make, that the conditions set out in Rule 3.68 are not met. So he declines to strike out the app review application on the basis of lack of jurisdiction. So this is a wonderful decision. This is fantastic. Now, in terms of what I think is going to happen with this decision, um, as I mentioned, I've got another uh, case and it's going concurrently with a bunch of other people. I'm not going to dish too many details on it at this stage because... Frankly, I know people at the CFO's office watch my videos, so I don't really want to tip my hand too heavily because they'll see what happens. That's uh, that's the long and short of it. However, I expect that this decision is not going to just be... I don't think that they're just going to say, oh, well, no biggie on this one. We're okay with the result. I expect that uh, they're going to appeal this one. And similarly, I don't know what will happen in mine, but I expect it will be appealed by whichever side happens to uh, happens to lose. My anticipation is that this jurisdiction question is going to end up at the big court, the Supreme Court of Canada over in Ottawa. So that'll be a big deal. Now, I said I'd come back to this when the judge said that there may be other consequences. One of the big other consequences that I see is that the the review process has a time limitation of 30 days from when you get this. But that time limitation, in my view, and ultimately we'll see if the courts agree, but in my view, that limitation starts when a valid notice in the prescribed form is received. That if they want to rely on that limitation period, that they have to follow the rules. That that is a benefit given to them for playing by the rules. And if they don't play by the rules, then they may have to deal with people bringing late applications. So that's a big one that I see here is that uh, them not doing so may force them to reissue uh, revocations and may allow for people who haven't filed yet to file in the future. Now that's something you're going to want to call a lawyer about, talk with them. But this case, quite frankly, is worth lifting a glass over. So... Anyway, thank you for watching. I know this has been longer than many of my recent videos, but I think it's worth it. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe if you want to see more content, if you want to help this channel grow. Uh, I also want to thank my Patreon supporters on this one. At the $50 level, George Demo, People of Canada. At the $30 level, uh, Steve uh, Browning. $20 level, Kevin Fleet and Dale Nesbitt. And at the $10 level, Ma Buddy Keith, Process Eng, Stephen Larson, General Counsel of the CCFR, John Robinson, Tim Rogers, Roy Haddock, Frackles Dak, John Alexandre Tessier, Cameron Johnson, Sir Goat, Sites and Arms Limited, Chaba Hollow, Peter H., Craig Kwan, Akin Coxall, North Central Process Service, Toys Are for Boys, Ian Vaughn, Milan Vrekic, Terence Griffiths, Doug Thompson, Mark D., Brad Crooker, Jason Harrington, Lee Kiso, Mark Stout, Michelle Stotzel, Scott Sweetman, Mike Rhodes, Alvaro Batallé, DF, Stacey Cartnell, Tactical Advantage TV Canada, Ian S., Dave Leslie, Juan, Donald Duncan, Stefan Conquist, Darren Duell, Sean Crane, Ian Hutchinson, Rory, Travis, BC Bushcraft Leather, John Singarty, Misa Komarevich, and David Moga. Once again, I think this is a really big deal. I really wanted to get this case to you as soon as possible. Uh, I'm excited. I, you know... This one is one of those cases that just, I know I'm a total law nerd and particularly a firearms law nerd, but sometimes you read a case and you're just, it gets you fired up. And I know that makes me a weird person, but uh, this is one of those cases. So thank you for watching. I hope you're as excited and as fired up as I am. And I hope I've armed you with knowledge. Until next time. And I'm just going to inject this little bit as an addendum here. It wasn't recorded sort of contemporaneously. But you might be asking, why do we care? Because ultimately, this doesn't cancel the order in council. It doesn't say, hey, now you can take your guns to the range. However, this is a major step in terms of securing procedural fairness.
because these sorts of games in terms of trying to get around section 74 reviews are something that in my view is wildly improper and in my view it's something that the courts should be taking a more active uh, interest in shutting down and so I'm happy to see this sort of case where the court is saying no you know you can't pretend that a revocation is something else something that you just made up because it's convenient you guys have to follow the law and you know we're not going to accept when you say that you've not you know you're not revoking you're nullifying so I really like that for this reason I really want to see the courts uh, curtail this practice of trying to sort of play games and engage in uh, again to quote coy avoidance of the review processes so that to my mind is why this is a big deal I'm sorry it's not going to get you you know able to take your AR-15 to the range I really wish it would because I've got an AR-15 sitting you know in a gun safe not far from me that I would love to be taking to the range right now in fact I'd rather be doing that than recording this video but here we are and that's sort of the best we can establish here.